it's definitely more of an ordeal than people think, you know, like you can move it, but like my house is 13,000 pounds. So, you know, the tile cracked in my kitchen last time. Your house isn't gonna fall apart or anything, but it, it's definitely more of an ordeal. Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 204 with Alaska Wagoner. What does a realtor think of tiny houses? And what's a tiny house concierge? Today, I speak with Alaska Wagoner, who shares her experience buying a pre-owned tiny house, dealing with winter plumbing issues galore, finding parking, and more. I hope you stick around. But before we get started, did you know that I personally send Tiny House newsletter every week on Tuesdays? It's called Tiny Tuesdays, and it's a weekly email with Tiny House news, interviews, photos, and resources. It's free to subscribe, and I even share sneak peeks of things that are coming up, ask for feedback about upcoming podcast guests, and more. It's really the best place to keep a pulse on what I'm doing in the Tiny House space, and also stay informed of what's going on in the tiny house movement. To sign up, go to thetinyhouse.net slash newsletter, where you can sign up for the Tiny Tuesdays newsletter. And of course, you can unsubscribe at any time. I will never send you spam. And if you ever don't want to receive emails, it's easy to unsubscribe. So again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash newsletter. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy next week's Tiny Tuesdays newsletter. All right, I am here with Alaska Wagoner. Alaska is a writer, realtor, and tiny home owner from Colorado. She is the founder of The Tiny House Concierge, a company that offers consultation services for people looking to rethink their housing and rewrite their lives. She's also a bi-monthly columnist for Tiny House Expedition and is currently gearing up to MC this month's Tiny Fest San Diego. If you'd like to connect with her, she's best found on her website, Instagram, or other new Tiny House Concierge YouTube channel. Alaska Wagoner, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, yeah, good to have you on. So um, I guess my first question is, um, what, what is a Tiny House Concierge? A Tiny House Concierge is an answer to a problem that I saw happening in Tiny House world. I saw a lot of people really excited about tiny houses and they would go out and try to pursue it. And then they would immediately get wrapped up in this giant ball of questions and, you know, not know what to do next. It was kind of like buying a house and it's also kind of not like buying a house. And so since I have a background in real estate, I hold a real estate license and I've spent the last, you know, a little while figuring all this out for myself and going tiny, I realized I was kind of in the perfect position to combine my areas of expertise and help people make sense of it. So when you think of like a hotel concierge, you know, you're in a new place, you're excited, and you just kind of need some direction about how to get going, you, you go to the concierge desk and somebody is like, tell me about your life and I'm going to help direct you uh, toward a good time. Very nice. Very nice. So you're kind of a tiny house generalist who can answer, just kind of answer questions with inside knowledge. Absolutely, yes. So I, I, I was hoping we could kind of rewind all the way back to, you know, before you were living tiny, what, what was the thing that made you decide to, to go for it? You know, I was, I was living a life that was very unsustainable in, in every possible way. It was, it was financially unsustainable. It was emotionally unsustainable. It was ecologically unsustainable. And I felt very, I felt very trapped. I felt like I had to choose, you know, between time and money. I didn't understand this time money conundrum. I felt like if I had a job where I had enough time, I wouldn't have the money to do the things that I wanted and found valuable. And if I pursued a job that maybe paid a lot more, I wouldn't have the time. And this kind of led to a very intense deep dive of my life. I did a lot of, you know, personal research myself about different kinds of lifestyles and and ultimately how much the life I envisioned cost. Because in my head I was like this is a 30 million dollar life. But when I started actually like doing the math and 
looking at different ways of approaching that life, I realized that if I was willing to rethink things a little bit, I could live that life that I desired on much less money with much less of a carbon footprint and in a way that gave me a lot more emotional bandwidth as well. Yeah, I like that. That's that feels very similar to kind of my own tiny journey or or the reasoning behind choosing to go tiny when you realize that there's a paradox between that time and money situation. Absolutely. And and it's kind of like I feel like tiny houses are this kind of like secret magic portal out of that the out of that conundrum. Yes. Yes, they are. And in fact, I refer to tiny house magic all the time for that exact reason. They 100% are a magic portal. Nice. What are um what's an example or two of of tiny house magic in in your life? Yeah, well, my my favorite example happened shortly after I moved into the house. Mm-hmm. I I bought my house furnished and I realized that I had a window fan that was extremely dirty that came with the house and I put it outside to throw away. I know that's horrible, but it, I didn't know how to take it apart. I didn't know how to clean it. I, it was too dirty mm-hmm. to donate, like, you know. And, and then I had this moment where I realized, like, wait a minute. I'm actually not drowning in rent anymore. I'm actually not stressed out. And I had this moment where I was like, I think I actually can clean this fan. So I cleaned it. Uh, it turned out it was a $50 fan. And then I realized, wow, that's $50 I don't have to spend at work. That gives me even less stress and even more emotional bandwidth to tackle the next project, Mm -hmm. which might be even bigger and even more expensive, which would give me even more bandwidth. And I realized I was like, wow, we've suddenly reversed the spiral. Like instead of a life that was getting bigger and more expensive and more out of my control, a tiny house has taken it and shifted it the other way. So now my life is less expensive, easier, more fun, and I have more skills. I love that. Yeah. What? Or you mentioned that you, you bought your tiny house furnished. So I'm, I'm, does that mean that you, that somebody else lived in your tiny house before you bought it? Yes. So I, my house was built uh, by Mint Tiny Homes in British Columbia, Canada. Love, love, love my builder. Um, And I, I just got really lucky. I, I found somebody who had purchased a home and they decided to go into van life and, and downsize again. And so they were, they were selling Uh. this house and. You know, I, I probably should have done like a, a little bit more research, but I, I got really lucky and the house has been great. And um, yeah, I feel I feel very blessed to it was nice to be able to walk into a house and have someone be able to explain to me, you know, oh, these are the quirks or this is what you have to know. And, you know, be able to see it as opposed to having to go through the building process. I wasn't in a position to handle that at the time. So. Um, yeah, I, I bought it secondhand and, and that was a really good fit for me. That's awesome. Is there, is there anything about it that you'd change? People ask me that very little, very little. I think if I were to move in with somebody, another closet would be good. I I don't understand what would happen to person B's clothes. Um, (laughs) other than that, oh, not really. Honestly, I'm 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 pretty happy in here. That's awesome. Yeah, tiny house for one versus a tiny house for two are are two they're not that far apart, but there are some, you know, some things, some some design things. And then if you're thinking about more than two, then you're in a whole nother design. That's a whole nother thing. I've thought about that. I was like, if I ever got a cat, like I would have to get rid of my Costco closet. So I would need to rethink my life again, you know, for the litter box to go in. So I would either need to rethink my life or rethink, you know, who I'm bringing into it. But what's what's your Costco closet? Oh, my gosh. I I have a stair in my in my in my stairs that's really deep. The stairs kind of curve around. So I've got one stair that's about two feet deep. And that's where I hide my bulk brownies. And my my Costco stuff, because I was like, I will not move into a tiny house and then be forced to buy everything and like, you know, two tablespoon packets and drive myself crazy. So the Costco thing was a big source of anxiety. That's probably my biggest source of anxiety (laughs) in going tiny. I didn't worry about like the shoes or anything like I worried about the Costco and it it's worked out except paper towels. The paper towels I keep in the trunk of my car. I can't figure 
Costco paper towels out, but I probably shouldn't be using paper towels anyway. So maybe that's just incentive. Yeah. I was going to say, just, just get a bunch of, uh, bunch of rags from Costco and then just re you can just wash them, <laughs> reuse them. There you go. Solved. Does your tiny house have laundry? Yes. Yes. I do have a stackable washer and dryer. That's, that is something that really helps enable the, the reusable towel system. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So as a, a real estate professional, are you involved with helping others buy and sell tiny homes? Well, tiny homes are, are interesting. Right now, like 99% of tiny homes are, are not affixed to land. So they are considered personal property at this point in time, which means uh -huh. that my real estate license doesn't cover helping people buy and sell personal property. Uh -huh. Where my real estate license is handy is that you're still buying a house. So when people go out of the loan, they tend to forget things like, oh, I need to get a home inspection or, oh, I need to, you know, make sure that the person selling me the house actually owns it and that the paperwork is in alignment. And, you know, I want to buy land. What, what's involved in buying land? You know, what things do I have to consider? Mm -hmm. What is zoning? And so usually people will come to me just, just kind of with a big ball of questions some of which are tiny house related, some of which are real estate related. And I'm kind mm -hmm. of a, a translator between those two fields. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And, and I hadn't realized, so are you I, actually not allowed to help someone buy or sell a tiny house, like personal property in that way? Or is it just not, is it frowned upon? <laughs> there, there are people out there trying to do that. Uh-huh who have real estate licenses and are, are, are going after that. I'm not, I'm not comfortable doing it directly, like directly helping someone with a sale. Mm -hmm. And I also don't feel like that's where I'm called. The, the further along I go in this, I'm realizing that, you know, I'm, I'm called to housing in so far as I think it's a very direct route to well-being. You know, it's one of our biggest, it's, for most of us, it's our biggest expense. Yeah. So that's our biggest opportunity to change the direction and shape our lives. And so I'm, I'm interested in real estate and I'm glad that I know it and I use it a lot, but it's largely in pursuit of well-being and lifestyle and sustainability. Like that's where my interest in housing is coming from. So no, I, I don't directly help people buy and sell tiny houses, but I will okay. help them understand, you know, the process. Got it. Got it. Very nice. Where um, do you live in Colorado in your tiny house? Do you live in a community? Do you live on rented land? Tell us about your, your parking. I, I live, I live on rented land for right now. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've lived in RV parks before as well. Uh huh. And, and they've been great. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm really enjoying where I'm at right now and, and we'll kind of have to see what the future holds. I think at, at some point I would like to own the land under the tiny house, but yeah, that might be a little ways off. We're going to see, see how things shake out. Yeah. That's something that I've, I've definitely found is like, even though it's a movable house, there's like a lot of things that need to get hooked up and attached and done in order to park it somewhere. And after, you know, even moving it once or twice, I, I'm, I'm kind of of the, like, I don't want to do that again. I would, I would like to own the land under it. It's definitely more of an ordeal than people think, you know, like you can yeah. move it, but like my house is 13,000 pounds. So, you know, the tile cracked in my yeah. kitchen last time I, when I took it from Texas to Colorado. So it, your mm. house isn't going to fall apart or anything, but it, it's definitely more of an ordeal than people think. Yeah. So you have done some kind of longer distance moves then? I've done one. So my, my house, like I said, was, was born in Canada and it's, first home was was Austin, Texas, and then I moved it from Texas to Colorado. Wow. So I've done one. And did you go to see it in person when you were when you were considering buying it? I did. And that was actually the first time I'd ever been inside a tiny house. I <laughs> I I looked into tiny houses and I I actually wasn't intending to buy a tiny house. I was intending to buy a, a regular house. And that that plan just kept falling through and then i i saw this tiny house for sale and i was just like had this overwhelming 
feeling of that is my house. And mm. yeah, I, I called the owners. I was like, you don't understand. This is my house. Like I'm in the car. I'm halfway to Texas. Like they, they probably thought I was a little nuts, but fortunately they went with it. And, uh, wow. Yeah. So I, I walked in the house and, and just looked at it and I was like, okay, I think I could do this. And I sat on the couch, the couch was comfortable. And I was like, I'm in. So you went through the whole process of like, is tiny house living right for me in like a drive? Pretty, pretty much. I, I had researched it briefly wow. during my deep dive uh, a few years earlier. So I, I, at that time I'd looked into van life, RV life, uh, living overseas and, and working remotely. I'd looked into all kinds of living situations. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I was, I was just at a time in my life where I, I kind of quit everything. You know, I, I quit my job. I walked away from my new business. I ended my marriage. I put my stuff in storage. I moved to Alaska. I'd moved to three other states, you know, since then. And yeah, I was just at a place where I didn't have anything. You know, I didn't have a partner. I didn't have a career path. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have, you know, it was, like, it was really starting over from scratch. And I think that that made it a little bit easier for me to do something like step into tiny house living on the fly for sure. Yeah. Wow. So it sounds like you had really shed a lot of your, of your life and you kind of started with the tiny house that, that almost like the starting fresh, but the tiny house was the first thing. Yeah. When, when I was done, I was done. You know, I, I'm one of those rip the bandaid off people Uh when it comes to pain and suffering. I, I would just rather like face it, get through it, let's go. And, you know, a, a tiny house wasn't necessarily the plan, but it, it could not have worked out better. I'm so grateful for this little magic capsule. Nice. Um, so, so on your YouTube channel, there are a couple of different videos called Tiny House Meltdown and Tiny House Meltdown 2. So what, <laughs> without giving too much away, what, what were these tiny house meltdowns? Yeah, well, okay. So tiny houses, tiny house living is, it's a little bit of a learning curve in some ways. And I feel like I've had maybe more of a learning curve than most, mm-hmm. mostly because of just freak random things. You know, there was a blizzard when I was in Texas. Mm-hmm that broke a main water line in the city of Austin. And I was without water for 14 days. And, you know, I've had frozen pipes and I've had hoses that were, you know, nothing to do with the builder, but just to do with like accessory pieces and, yeah, you know, and, and just my own inexperience, you know, I, I left on vacation and didn't think about the fact that my water heater is run on propane. All I was thinking of is like my stove runs on propane. I'm not going to be cooking. I'll replace the propane when I get back. Mm. And I broke my water heater because the cycle couldn't run to keep it warm. So anyway, I wanted to make sure that, you know, because I love posting the pretty pictures on Instagram and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, and I wanted to make sure that I was balancing that with information, you know, about, about the things that maybe don't go right. So that people don't get this idea that this lifestyle is easy and perfect and all you have to do is buy a tiny house and it'll all be okay and magically work out. You know, I, I, I say that the pretty pictures are how a tiny house always feels to me. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to kind of take that one step further and be like, hey, you know what? Sometimes it's not good. And when it's not good, I have a meltdown and I film it for YouTube because that's, you know, my my best stab at nice. getting the news out there. <laughs> yeah. And so it it seems like some of these problems or many of them related to plumbing and water, which is, which is a challenge and you're in Colorado. So certainly experience some freezing temperatures. You know, what have you done to kind of mitigate or how do how actually, how do you get your water into the house and, and back out? Uh, well, I do, I have a heated hose right now. Okay. And so during, during the summer, I have just a regular hose. Right now, I have a heated hose. Mm-hmm. Although I had one heated hose, brand new, sprung a leak, same brand. Another heated hose just stopped working. Mm-hmm. At this point, I'm, I'm not even willing to have them replace it even under warranty because I don't want to create trash. You know, I'm throwing 150 mm-hmm. feet of product away this month. 
and I'm not willing to do that. So I got on the forums and had some people teach me how to do kind of a DIY version. And, and that's what we'll be tackling next. So see how that goes. Nice. So a DIY, a DIY heated hose. Yeah. Yeah. Regular hose, the heat cable. And then it looks like inside the house, um, you've got uh, a Berkey water filter. I do. I love my Berkey. And is that just because you don't want to drink the, the hose water? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty into clean living. So I don't, I don't clean with chemicals in the tiny house. Um, I heavily filter all of my water. Mm-hmm. Try to eat organic. You know, it, it's not that I'll never eat Taco Bell or have a Red Bull, but yeah, by and large, I, I try to leave live pretty low toxin yeah uh, my sister had major autoimmune issues and that was kind of the the catalyst for changing the way that I live and and that's actually one of the things that my tiny house is built around is is health writing an adventure yeah so when I put when I put money into something in my house or I put time into something in my house I I try to have it hit those three categories yeah and it looks like the kitchen is is big and very functional with the beautiful range hood and, and just like a decent amount of counter space and a big sink and everything. Yeah, definitely. It, you know, I'm somebody who really likes to cook and, and that was another, you know, uh-huh. less, less of a concern than the Costco, but, but definitely a concern was, <laughs> am I going to be able to cook in a tiny house kitchen? Yep. And it's changed the way that I cook. You know, I will skip certain ingredients or substitute things so I don't have to buy more spices or whatever or i'll make something a one-pot meal that's maybe not intended to be a one-pot meal so it's changed the way that i cook but it has not at all stifled my cooking i just as a challenge i cooked a full thanksgiving dinner from scratch last year and and wrote an article about like that process and that that was hilarious that was fun um much more doable than i would have thought i thought i was going to run into a lot more problems but worked out okay yeah, I guess did you did you kind of strip down? How did you make Thanksgiving a one pot meal? Oh, that that was not a one pot meal. That was <laughs> I, I have a pie on the stairs and I've got like yeah, stuffing sitting on the couch for just a second while I you know yeah that yep. it was a little dramatic. I made it. I made like a little Cornish game hen. It was mm-hmm. it was cute. I have to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> what are the um? What are the dimensions of your house? Is it, I can't quite tell from the pictures, is it wider than 8.6 or is it standard standard width? It's standard width. Yeah, I'm at 26 okay. feet long, eight and a half feet wide. Nice. Well, you've got that, that L couch that is such a crucial thing to have. It really is. That is absolutely one of my favorite features of the house. Not just because it's comfortable and not just because it has storage, but because either direction I sit on it, I have a long view. Mm. So if I sit the short way, you know, facing the short wall, yeah, I'm actually looking out my doors, which are glass. So I can look straight through Mm -hmm. and out to the outside. And if I sit the other way on the couch, I look down the length of my tiny house, which is honestly nice. I look that way more than I look outside because I, it just, my house brings me so much happiness. I just want to stare at it. So yeah. Yeah. Couch position is important. And and is yeah, for sure. And it's it's a great design. Which is is your house one of the one of the models that that mint tiny house company currently sells? Like do you know which which mint house it is? Yeah, it's it's the Napa edition. It's and the Napa. then okay. it was customized. Yeah, it was customized a bit by the original owner. Um, I did call them okay. and I said, Hey, if I ever want another one of these, like, you know, like as a rental property or, or something to, yeah. you know, park in another state, go back and forth, kind of deal. Like, could you build me that exact house? And, and they said that they could. So if anybody needs nice. my exact nice. house, it's available. How, um, how do you heat? How do you heat in the winter in Colorado? Um, I have electric heat, okay. but I also have my stove and my water heater are both propane. Okay. and I'm glad that you brought up heat because like that is a game changer having two sources of heat that has probably in like the year and a half I've had my tiny house saved me four times, you know, where, you know, either the electrical, we were in a bunch of storms. I didn't have electrical for a couple weeks. 
but I was able to heat, you know, water on the stove and cook hot food and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then I've also had, mm-hmm. you know, run out of propane or whatever, but at least I have heat. So if anybody is remotely thinking that they might move to a cold climate, or if somebody just wants to increase the resale, like resaleability of their house, mm-hmm. two sources of heat, I think is key. Yeah, that's that's interesting to think about the resaleability of a tiny house. I feel like that's something that someone who has a background in real estate would definitely think about. Are, are there some other features or things that you you advise people to think about when they are thinking like, hey, maybe I'll sell this tiny house down the road? What are what are some other features that you recommend? Yeah, um, certifications are going to be your friend. I I know not always, mm-hmm. you know, not all insurance companies or RV parks or whatever are asking for certifications at this point. I think the more we step toward legality, the more of a role those are going to play. Mm-hmm. So understanding what your certification options are and, and picking one that's appropriate uh, is key. Uh, building, and this kind of goes with the heat thing, but building for multiple climates you know, tiny houses move. Mm. So sometimes I'll see inexperienced builders build for the climate they're physically in, or I'll see, you know, customers, people buying tiny houses who ask for it to be built to the climate they're currently in. But then they're like, oh, my house moves. So a year later, they're moving across the country. Now they've got a whole different thing. Or they want to sell their house. They found a buyer. The buyer's three states away. Now the buyer has different ventilation concerns or, you know, different temperature yep. concerns or whatever. So, you know, maybe they have solar only, but now they move to Seattle. Like now what, you know, so there are different things you can do, but, um, building to multiple climates is helpful. Certifications are helpful. Um, those would be the the two main ones I would bring up. Nice. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things to do at tiny house festivals is, and I don't do this to like people's personal tiny houses, but you know, there's always a lot of builders there with spec tiny houses. I, instead of walking in, I immediately like crawl down on the ground and look underneath uh, because you can learn a lot about what they've thought about in terms of climate and, and water. You know, when I see, you know, like, for example, at the Georgia Tiny House Festival, I saw a lot of tiny houses that had plumbing underneath the house, like P-traps, plumbing lines just out there hanging out underneath the house. And that can tell you a lot about whether the house is designed to move or not, or is it designed to, to never be in a cold climate? Absolutely. Wow. I've never done that climbed under the house. I mean, I've climbed under mine, but I haven't climbed under any, I'm going to start doing that now. <laughs> I mean, you don't great. have to actually climb under, but just like, you know, just pop your head under and see, see what's going on under there. <laughs> Love it. Yes. Speaking of tiny house festivals, it sounds like you are are heading to one soon. And by the time this episode airs, it probably will have already passed. So so how was Tiny Fest San Diego? <laughs> tiny Fest, Tiny Fest San Diego, Tiny Fest California was great. Yes, I had so much fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm well, so of course, excited. I'm we're so talking excited. at the beginning of March. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to MC Tiny Fest San Diego? I am. I am. I am. I am so honored. I'm. Wow. It's it's going to be very cool. I have a lot of people that are going to be there that I've met virtually, and I'm so excited to mm-hmm. meet them in real life. And yeah, just get out. You know, I my tiny journey happened largely during the pandemic. So I'm excited to kind of get get more out there and yeah, yeah, get get some energy going. How how long have you been in your house now? I bought it at the end of like October 2020. And I've okay. been, uh, the first six, seven months were, I was kind of going back and forth. So I'd be there for like a weekend and then I'd be gone for three weeks and then I'd be back for a week. And so it it was some back and forth for, for a while. And that was mm-hmm. partially because I was dealing with some family stuff and partially because I didn't know since I was starting over from scratch, I didn't know where I was going to live or, or anything like that. Yep. So that took some time to kind of figure out where I was going to park it and, and how. And then I found a, an awesome spot in Colorado and I love to ski. So I was like, okay, 
Deal done. Let's go. Awesome. All right. So what's your what's your home mountain? Uh Eldora is the one that's closest to my house. It's about 45 minutes away. Hmm. So that's there. But Copper Mountain's not too far. Um, I'm I'm hoping to ski when I'm in California. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see if I can pull that off. But yeah, skiing nice. is pretty important. Nice. Yes, me too. That's why I live in Vermont. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good skiing here too. So where um where in or outside of your tiny house do you store your your ski gear? Right now it's in my car. Um I would like a better solution for that. I don't I don't know. I I like the idea of having a place to like display my skis, you know? Yeah. Cuz that my life is so focused on a few things that bring me joy like Yeah. I almost like the idea of working it into the decor somehow, like having them like up on the wall or something. Yep. Yep. Maybe, maybe not year round, but at least during the season, you know, so I can just kind of grab and grab and go. Right. Right. I haven't figured that out yet. So for the meantime, in my car. In the car. All right. Yeah. I've always I've always thought that it would be cool to find, you know, an old set of like uh, ski roof racks from a car, you know, the kind that's like a mouth that like clamps down on the skis and just mount them on the side of your house. And just have like your skis just on a rack, just right on the side of the house. That's genius. If I do that, I'll put a little plaque that just says Ethan Waldman, you know, ski, sure. tiny house ski rack. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. The problem for us is that we have too many pairs of skis. I would need a lot of racks. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> then, you, then you'd be that, that tiny house. with it. Maybe you can make yeah. like a little fence. Yeah. Like a little, like a picket yeah, a fence, ski but fence made out of skis. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, one thing that I like to ask all of my guests is, you know, what's two or three resources? This could be, you know, books that you've read or YouTube channels or people um, that that kind of have helped you on your tiny house journey that that you'd like to share with our listeners. Sure. Okay. I would say the biggest, like, I don't know what you're saying, catalyst maybe for helping me to really evaluate my life and economize it and mm -hmm. and kind of go for it was a blog called Mr. Money Mustache. Ah. Um and he's a he's a Colorado tech dude who was really into early retirement and efficient living and he comes at it from a very like techy numbers kind of place but I love that he's done the math on so many crazy things and he literally covers everything from like, you know, raising children to going on vacation to grocery shopping and lives a really great life yeah. on very little money and, and resources. And so I definitely got a lot of inspiration there. Instagram has been a big source of, of inspiration and help. I know that uh, at this tiny journey is has been one of my my tiny house friends and she's really done a lot to help me hold it all together emotionally and you know welcome me to the community and and that's been nice that's been really great um yeah she's a she's a single mom she's raising raising her daughter in a tiny house and and totally killing it and yeah so i would say yeah mr money mustache for math wise and then at this tiny journey emotionally has has helped me hold it all together. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, um, Alaska Wagner. This was so fun to have you on the show. And uh, good luck at the festivals. I wish I wish I could be at at one of them. There, there hasn't been one like in the Northeast, like within driving distance from me for a couple of years. But I'm hoping that there'll be something soon to go to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, well, thank you so much for having me on. This was this was really really fun and. And I'm happy, happy to meet you. And I definitely hope to cross paths someday at a festival. Thank you so much to Alaska Wagoner for being a guest on the show today. You can find the show notes, including a complete transcript and lots of photos of Alaska's tiny house at thetinyhouse.net slash 204. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 204. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.